1 Kings chapter 12. Israel, the northern tribes, have rebelled against Judah. And Rehoboam, the king of Judah, finds himself with a very small nation. And Jeroboam is the new king, just as God had said. And so, having been established as king, this is what Jeroboam chooses to do. And we pick up at verse 25. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25. This is the word of God. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, The kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these, these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will live again they will again give their allegiance to their lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people went even as far as Dan to worship the one there. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel he also installed priests at the high places he had made. On the fifteenth day of the eighth month, a month of his own choosing, he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. What is a counterfeit? You ever think about that? Most of the time if we hear counterfeit, we think in terms of money, don't we? Where somebody tries to pass off counterfeit money. But a counterfeit is something or someone passed off as authentic. Something or someone who's passed off as authentic. And that's exactly what Jeroboam was doing in these very verses. Failing to trust God, he sought to solidify his own kingship by introducing a counterfeit religion into the newly formed kingdom of Israel. In his commentary, Warren Wearsby describes his actions and his insights here I think are very helpful and I quote what Jeroboam did was to take advantage of the tendency of the Jewish people to turn to idols and the desire of most people for a religion that is convenient and not too costly and close enough to the authorized faith to be comfortable for the conscience convenient and comfortable. Jeroboam was not the last one to try this, nor was Israel the last nation to fall for it. In fact, every generation of the church, the people of God, must be alert to attempts to counterfeit the true faith. And we see that in our own day. Counterfeit Christianity. And the truth is that counterfeit Christianity is no Christianity at all. Leaving those who follow it under the condemnation of their sins, under the judgment of God. Claiming to be true, it is a lie. Just like a counterfeit bill. It's passed off as the real thing. And it may fool lots of people. But in the end, its ultimate value is nothing. First, let's consider Jeroboam's counterfeit Judaism. Jeroboam's counterfeit Judaism. 
The bottom line in this whole story that frames the whole story is that Jeroboam did not trust God. He did not believe God's word. That's the crux of the issue. If you read everything else in this story and you miss this, then you've missed the whole purpose. The reason for his action was that he did not trust God. You say, how do we know that? We'll look back over at chapter 11. Just flip over there and look at verse 37. This is where the prophet tells Jeroboam what God is going to do, affirms the promise of God to him. Verse 37 of chapter 11, However, as for you, I will take you and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel. If you do whatever I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and commands as David my servant did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. That was the word of God to Jeroboam. You serve me. You follow me wholeheartedly like David did. And I will build a great nation out of you. But Jeroboam didn't believe God. If you listen to the scripture reading, you'll see in verse 26, Jeroboam thought to himself. He doesn't say, now the word of God told me this. No, he thinks for himself. He's looking at everything from his own perspective and he concludes that now that everything is settled, when these people have a chance to think on what's happened, they're going to go back to Jerusalem to worship there and they will eventually turn on me and I'll lose my kingdom. Isn't that exactly what God had told him would happen? He said, no, I will establish you. You will have a kingdom and a dynasty if you follow me. But he didn't believe God. And he wasn't faithful to God. And so he crafted his own religion. He said, now the way to keep people loyal to me is for them to have their own religion. And so he takes elements that they were familiar with. And he makes his own religion. Stop and think about what he does here. There's a counterfeit God. The bull idols. Nothing new there, is it? It's what Aaron made for the people. Well, we got to have something to worship. Well, here's your God that brought you out of Egypt. When I heard Jeroboam say that in the text... I thought, that's exactly what Aaron told the people in their rebellion after God had delivered them. Second verse, same song. So he says, here are your gods, one in Dan in the northern part of the kingdom, one in Bethel, the southern part of the kingdom. And the writer says, people would even travel all the way up to Dan to worship at that place shrine but you see that tapped into their idolatrous natures they said oh yeah man we're getting back to our roots they had a counterfeit priesthood he appointed priests the king appointed priests you know and I know that the Lord appointed the Levites to be the priests to minister before his people So Jeroboam says, well, we need priests. If you're going to have a legitimate religion, you've got to have priests. So he appointed the priest. And he who appoints the priest controls the priest. If you don't believe it, read European history. When the monarchs fought with the Pope over who could appoint bishops who appointed priests, there was a counterfeit festival mirroring the Passover. So they would have no need to go south to Jerusalem. They could stay right here. We have our own festival. Counterfeit sacrifices. We'll do our own sacrifices with our own priests. But you know and I know that God had given specific direction as to who could offer the sacrifices 
how they were to be offered, and how they were to be consumed. Not just any sacrifice would please God, but notice Jeroboam could say, here are your gods, here's your priesthood, we have a special day, we offer sacrifices. He created an alternate, counterfeit religion claiming it was the real thing. So no, you haven't abandoned God. You've actually come closer to God. Ralph Davis, in his commentary on 1 Kings, makes this observation, and it's awesome. Jeroboam then turns away from orthodoxy, right believing, not because it's no longer true, but because it is no longer useful. Did you hear that? Jeroboam didn't say, oh, I'm rejecting everything in Jerusalem because it's no longer true. Truth had nothing to do with it. It was no longer useful. It no longer benefited him as he saw it. He didn't turn away because he concluded it wasn't true. It was no longer useful. Now what about contemporary or modern counterfeits in the Christian world? Just want to give you some pointers to think about this morning. Contemporary counterfeit Christianity. First thing I want you to note is that a counterfeit will always use similar terminology, similar rituals as the authentic. You don't take and counterfeit a $100 bill on common copy paper. Well, some stupid people have, but you get caught quickly. Use the same terminology. I see it all the time. And I have learned a question. When they use these terms, what do they mean? What do you mean when you use that term? What are they saying? Because we can use the same term and not mean the same thing. I have to tell you, in recent uh, events in our nation, people talk about patriotism and all these kinds of things. Well, they have a different view than I do. Because I don't think you burn the flag and I don't think you stomp on the flag. I don't think that's being a patriot. You may be exercising your rights, but I think there are some things that must bind us together or we will surely be torn apart by our individual biases and opinions. Oh, I disagree, but I don't burn the flag because of it. You see, we use the same terms, but they mean different things, don't they? Be sure you understand what somebody means just because they use the same term doesn't mean they're referring to the same truth. The surest way to recognize a counterfeit is to be immersed in the authentic. I remember in my first church, there was a family who got involved in a cult. They had gotten very wealthy because he hit on a business idea that panned out and turned into a gold mine. And they were prey for all kinds of people who wanted their money. There was a religious leader who gained some notoriety back then. And I remember spending an afternoon with their son going through John to prove that Jesus claimed he was the son of God, that he was divine, because they were being taught that Jesus was not divine, he was just a good man. He's the son of God, but we all are sons and daughters of God. He was using the same terminology, but the definitions were totally different. Spent the whole afternoon. Couldn't budge him. Because you see, it wasn't a battle of the mind, it was a battle of the heart. And he had been sucked in, he and his whole family. 
I'd like to tell you it ended well. They all sold out, moved out west, became just like this with that man until their money dried up. In the meantime, their only daughter married a follower of that cult who was high up and on one evening an icy road they crashed and both were killed and their child. And the last I heard the mother said, I don't believe in God anymore. He took my girl, my grandbaby. You immerse yourself in the truth. You immerse yourself in the authentic. Know the Bible. Know the historic creeds of the church. The church, our church, is always adding stuff. I'm a little bit leery because most of the time everything that's added has an agenda behind it. So that's why I say the historic creeds, those that we know and have passed the test of time, that's why we stick with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. That's why we stick with the old confessions. You say, yeah, because you're an old goat. Maybe so. But the old ways were the ways that led to God. You know that Bible. That's why we teach it and preach it. Because there are a lot of people who use the Bible and twist it and pervert it to lead people astray. Worship where the elements of worship are biblical and always point to the glory and truth of God as revealed in the word. One of the things that you learn if you study Reformed history, the history of Reformed and Presbyterian churches, is that our forefathers in the faith insisted that our worship conform to what the Bible teaches. That worship is for the glory of God and we're blessed as God is glorified. Not that we worship so that we'll be blessed. For if God is glorified, you may go out feeling rebuked. Because the Holy Spirit will do that as he seeks to convict you. And that's not a bad thing. Some people think, I come, I buy my ticket and I'm supposed to be entertained. That's not biblical worship. And then make sure that the preaching of the word and the elements of worship declare Jesus Christ and the centrality of the cross in the declaration of the gospel. You hear gospel thrown around a lot, never the name Jesus. Or Jesus thrown around and never about the cross. That we need to follow his teachings, we need to do good things, and we need to be this kind of people. Well, let me tell you something, you can do all that and be lost. The foundation of our existence as people in the church is the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. And when we step away from that, we may be progressive and we may be more modern and we may be more open-minded, but we are more wrong. There are four elements I've identified. There are many more, I'm sure, that I just want to give to you this morning. Four elements of a counterfeit Christianity. In counterfeit Christianity, you'll see preaching using the Bible, but not from the Bible. That the Bible is used not as a means to teach us because it's the Word of God, but rather it's used as the springboard to teach what the preacher wants you to hear. One of the things that many people don't realize is I think that a preacher of the gospel who's truly a person of God deals with the text and all that's in it long before it's ever preached. And some people will say, preacher, you stepped on my toes. Well, I just hate to tell you, I don't do toe stepping. If you're convicted... I pray it's the Holy Spirit. He said, boy, preacher, I feel like you really hit me between the eyes. I go, no, because I was too busy looking at myself. I never devise sermons geared for you to pick on you. It's the word of God, and we preach the word of God, and that word is alive and powerful by the Holy Spirit, and God uses it. I've seen the same sermon People go out the door and one was comforted and blessed. One was convicted. 
One had questions, and one got something that I didn't even come close to. And I thought, where in the world did you get that? The Holy Spirit takes his word. But the counterfeit will always use the word as an excuse to teach what they want to be taught. You will never hear the counterfeit preacher saying, this is the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. Or like Billy Graham says, and I love over the years, having heard him preach over and over. And when he gets on a roll, he'll say, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. It's not what Billy says. It's not what the church says. It's what the Bible says because we believe it is the word of God. The false preachers will tell you, listen for the word of God. Because you see, in their terminology, the word of God is only the word of God when it speaks to you. So it's not really authoritative and binding in itself, only as you would give it some credibility. And there are variations on that, but I hear it all the time. And let me tell you, dear friends, it's the word of God whether you hear it or not. It's the word of God whether we obey it or not. It's the word of God whether we accept it or not. It will be the word that lasts long after we're gone. And that's why I stand beside an open grave and say with confidence, long after we're gone, the word in which we hope, the word in which this saint trusted will come to pass. Those that we remember with our flowers from time to time and I see their names and I smile and I miss them and I go, yes, there's our hope. Not in I feel good about it, not in I think it's going to happen, but the word of God says it will happen. And long after I'm dead and you've forgotten me, and that's okay, I pray you remember the word. The word that's able to save you. The word that's able to make you holy. Secondly, there's always a gospel without a cross. You'll see the cross minimized, if not ignored, in counterfeit Christianity. It's more about how you feel and how to get the best out of God. It's almost like God is the great bank, and how can you tap into it without making a deposit? That's not the gospel. That's not the Christian faith. You will always see a minimization of the cross. One scholar said years ago, well, that's just slaughterhouse religion. It's vile and no decent person wants to hear that. And I say, well, it's brutal, all right, because our sins are dastardly. It took the life of the Son of God to redeem me and you from our sins. That's why we sing about the precious blood of Jesus. Why we sing about glorying in the cross. To those who don't understand it is macabre. To those who know it is precious. It is life. And there is no life without the shedding of blood. There is no Christianity without the cross. Thirdly, worship without God as the focus of awe and wonder. My goal and my prayer as we worship every Sunday is that we look up. That we would hear God and see him as we worship him because the focus is him. Not us. Not our performance. Not how good the preacher does or how good the choir does or how well all the elements come together. But no, did we see Jesus? Did we glorify him by the songs that we sing, the prayers that we pray, by the giving of our tithes and offerings? By all the elements do we point to Jesus. But lots of modern worship is focused on the worshiper, not the one worshipped. And that's not biblical. It was A.W. Tozer who died, in fact, in 1963, who stated, Worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ within us. Worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ within us. 
You see, this isn't about us. It's about him. And because we are in relationship with him, when we worship, which is what we were created and redeemed to do, we are strangely satisfied. And because he is who he is, when he is exalted, when he is worshiped, he blesses his people. And finally, there's always a calling without a cost. There's a discipleship without a cross. Jesus clearly said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. It was the Apostle John, one of those who took up their cross to follow him, who said in 1 John 2, 6, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. One writer said years ago, we want a padded cross. We wear crosses around our necks, on our lapels, and sometimes we forget that that image is one of death and denial, self-denial. And when we wear that cross, it should ever be a reminder that I follow Jesus, no matter what the cost. Learn to discern the counterfeit from the authentic, for it is all around you. Sounds good, looks good, appeals to the flesh. But in the end, if it's not real, it leads to hell, not to heaven. Now let me ask you this morning, are you following a counterfeit Christianity? Like Jeroboam, you may have fashioned your religion to suit yourself. You take a bit of this that you like, a little bit of that, and you mix it together, and you're quite satisfied. Are you following a counterfeit Christianity? Are you looking for a Christ who makes little demands and basically lets you live as you choose? Are you seeking a convenient faith? So was Jeroboam. Several years ago now, a man named Wilbur Rees wrote a little poem that hits way too close to home. He says, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Christianity is not convenient and it's not useful. It is life-changing and it is God's very best for his people. One preacher said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and not tried. What about you? Between you and God this morning, have you been practicing a counterfeit? A faith that's convenient for you, that works when you need it to work, but isn't what the Bible calls you to in discipleship and faith? Let me tell you something, you will never give up anything for Christ that you won't gain in return that which is far, far better. You may not see it at the time, probably won't. That's why they call it faith. You may say, preacher, I know that I'm a follower of Christ. I've been born again. I've been changed. I see growth in my life, but ooh, that stings a little bit because... Sometimes I want faith to be more convenient and easier. Remember what we said at the beginning? Jeroboam didn't trust God. Isn't that my problem? Yeah. 
say, Lord, you really mean you want me to do this? That's going to be uncomfortable. That's going to stretch me. I don't want to give that up. I don't want to change my attitude there. I know you don't, but it's the best for you. And when I say no, I'm like Jeroboam and say, no, God doesn't know what he's talking about. I have to take care of myself. And that's why we have scars in it. His way is always good and right. And I call me first and then you. That we be honest before God and follow the true faith. That which we've learned from the scriptures, which our fathers and mothers have taught us from the Bible. For that is the true faith that leads to Christ. Christ crucified and glorified, the Savior of his church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us of your truth. And Lord, we pray that you would move in our hearts so that our desire is for you above all things. Let us learn from Jeroboam lest we find that we're fashioning our own religion that's convenient and useful, but not biblical and true. Lord, thank you that you've called us to be different. And so we pray that we'd be different, not because we're weird in and of our own selves, but because we follow you, period. Whatever the cost, wherever you lead. I want to thank you for folks who were willing to do that when they looked to me. I didn't fit the mold, I didn't fit the grid, and it sure took a lot of sweat and work and prayer for me to even be here. Thank you for people who trusted you when others were telling them, move on. And I think I can speak for all of us. This has been a good relationship, best one I've ever had. So when we are tempted to be like Jeroboam, remind us of that. There was a time we trusted you, we waited on you, it wasn't easy. But it was good, and you did good things, and still are. Oh, God, we would be those who speak the truth with our dying breath, pointing people to Jesus. May it ever be so in this church and in this preacher, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.